The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland, which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. on BCIT Magazine. Residents across the Lower Mainland are surveyed at large by TransLink. We'll look at how Vancouver's homeless are struggling with city bylaws. And an annual Remembrance Day dance becomes a fundraiser for a fallen officer. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Aaron Schultz. And I'm Twyla Amato. TransLink is looking to collect data from riders in order to make positive changes in the transit system. Lloyd Nellis has more on the new incentive. 400,000 people in Greater Vancouver commute every day using transit. TransLink has just sent out surveys in order to better serve these riders. It's a survey we do every five or six years. It's something similar to what you might find with the census. It's a, it gives us a clear snapshot of how people move around the region. So whether they travel by car, um, whether they take transit, walk, cycle, uh, it gives us a really clear picture that helps us plan better transportation. The hope is that the survey will reveal what needs improvement the most. We asked riders at BCIT what frustrates them and what should change. In the morning, the bus that connects me to the 25, which is a major BCIT bus, it comes every 20 minutes, so in order to get here on time, I have to get here 40 minutes early. When Patterson increased the 125 bus um, and make it run till, I think it only runs till like 9 o'clock or 9 a.m or just in peak times, maybe keep it running the whole day. I would say that there's more buses and more, so more knowledge about when the peak hours are because they just, uh, I just ended up waiting like 30 minutes for a bus, like, you know, just to get the head in the game and then, you know. Ryan says the data gathered will allow TransLink to figure out which routes need more service. We just hope that people will fill it out just for the benefit of, of themselves and the region. We want to plan a better transportation system for everyone, uh, alleviate that kind of congestion that frustrates people, and we want to make the system better. The findings of the report will be published next year. Lloyd Nellis and Cook Whitlam for BCIT Magazine. Bike owners often worry about their rides being stolen. Our reporter Lauren McFarland has the story on how an app is helping reduce thefts and puts minds at ease. This could be the price you pay for a brand new bike. But a lot of people in Vancouver have had their brand new bikes stolen soon after buying them. We have a lot of customers that'll buy a bike and it's stolen. We've had people have their bike stolen in one week, two weeks, six months. No matter who it is, if they have a bike, they need a lock. Many new bike owners may not be taking the right steps to keep their wheels safe, especially in this city. Vancouver, there's some crafty thieves, uh, meaning that they'll have like bike racks that are bolted to the ground and you'll think that that's safe, but if you actually look at the bolts or something like that, it's actually cut. So you can actually just lift the bike rack, play a little game of operation, slide the, uh, the lock off and ride away with the bike. In fact, studies show that while Toronto has the most bike thefts in Canada, Vancouver has the highest rate per capita. Enter Project 529 Garage. With it, you can register your bike by serial number, make and model, and report it missing as soon as it happens. Since we've been looking at the stats for that, we've never seen a decline in our bike theft. It's always gone up. Um, we launched in October of 2015, uh, November, December, January, we, uh, we saw, start to see the impact. The bike thefts went down almost immediately, and so in a year they were down 20%, in two years they were 30%. Project 529 also allows bike stores to join in and help their customers get their bikes back. The thing with the app is it re the bike stores can run stolen data as well. So if your bike gets stolen and you hit the, you know, the panic button on the app to say your bike's stolen, anybody can, anybody can see that uh, information. So the bike stores love that. So they'll, they get a lot of bikes from, you know, the crooks come in with these bikes. They know that they're stolen bikes, but before they had no tool, well, now the bike stores have a tool, and so we're getting recoveries out of the bike stores, and the bike stores love it because now they're, they're, you know, now they're a superhero as well, right? The VPD is happy the app is growing in the city, 
And for now, they hope everyone with a bike joins in. Lauren McFarland in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Lauren McFarland joins us now. Lauren, what's next for Project 529? So the most important thing for them right now is going to be securing more funding because the hope is that there's never going to be a monetary barrier to anybody who wants to use this service. But that is only going to happen if uh, police departments are able to put this into their budget. So right now VPD is going to be going to municipal and provincial governments to see if uh, this can fit in there somehow. Aaron? And what other initiatives are VPD taking to prevent bike thefts? Right now, they're really hoping to bring this sort of thing to campuses because it's students who really rely on their bikes for transportation. Now, UBC has had events in the past where they register their students with uh, Project 529, and Constable Brunt said he would love to see something like that come to BCIT as well. Back to you. Coming up on BCIT Magazine, Vancouver offers free diabetes risk assessments. And storm season is having a costly effect on local patriots. Control. Move out just a tiny bit. Sorry, say that again. Did you zoom out a tiny bit? It's, it's a quick two years. They get you in and they get you out, but you leave with so much more knowledge than you walk in. The BC Hockey League hosted the third annual BCHL showcase last weekend. The showcase also allows fans to come. Uh, the tools you learn are very valuable. Uh, you leave with a comprehensive knowledge of many of the programs that are used in everyday workforces around all the newsrooms in Vancouver. beginning of your two-year program, you don't really expect that in two years' time you're walking out ready to be a part of the journalism industry. Good morning and welcome to Evolution News. I'm Chantal Pizza. I was lucky enough to get a job a week after I graduated. I think that has a lot to do with uh, the teachers and fellow students prepping you for the outside life once you graduate from BCIT. Yeah, if it wasn't for BCIT, I'd be lost. <laughs> BCIT Magazine. It's Diabetes Awareness Month. Kayla Schultz reports on how Diabetes Canada is offering free risk assessments for the first time in BC. Annalise is only one of scores who came to Renfrew Community Centre on Monday to take a free diabetes risk assessment. We want to know whether I have something that would be to, in regards to diabetes. Annalise says the diabetes assessment made her more aware of her health. I'm a high risk and I was not aware of it. So I just want to change that and I want to get in touch with my doctor next. Men and women over the age of 40 are more likely to develop diabetes. Diabetes Canada says one in three Canadians will have the disease in their lifetime and 11 million Canadians currently live with diabetes. The risk assessment test is free both in person and online. Diabetes Canada says there are ways to prevent the disease. Eating healthy, um, being exercising regularly. Um, so if you do those few things, um, after that you could visit your doctor and find more uh, steps for prevention. Preventative measures can be as easy as eating more fruits and vegetables. Diabetes Canada hopes more events like this one will drive down the numbers of new patients. Kayla Schultz in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Residents of a tent city in Vancouver lost a vital part of winter survival. Hader Neani has the story on the city of Vancouver's crackdown on open flames in tents. A visit from Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services last week has made keeping warm at the Sugar Mountain tent city in Vancouver even more difficult. The fire marshals, and accompanied by the police, they came in here and took everybody's propane, their heaters, every source of keeping us warm and possible, and they left us here to freeze. It's a major blow to the homeless hoping to keep comfortable at the camp over the next few winter months, as well as an insult to some, like Derek Gagne, who lives at Sugar Mountain. Last time I checked, we human beings just like everybody else. We got rights, but clearly that ain't the case. But that's not how the city of Vancouver sees it. Their press release reads, fuel-powered appliances present significant hazards when used inside enclosed fabric spaces. The city says it's about safety. 
we don't sleep with them on it. And if we do, they're at a very low, very low level. So you can't, they can't catch, can't, and nothing can catch on fire. The city cites three recent incidents in BC where someone at a tent city has been injured or killed when an ignition source started a fire, though at least one of these three incidents involved a candle. Not trying to be funny or nothing, but you know what I mean? We've got to start from scratch and start over again, right? And so, though winter precautions are being taken, keeping warm has become even more complicated than it already was. Hader Nayani in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. As storm season begins here in BC, one Surrey business has already felt the effects, both financially and patriotically. Ben Phillips has the story. Normally at the top of this flagpole, a Canadian flag is proudly flying here in North Surrey. But due to a recent high winds, they delayed putting a new flag up. As Barnes Wheaton's GM's Devron Quest explains, it's an expensive process to fly the Canadian flag. Not at all. It's something that the ownership here, Mr. Barnes and our general manager, Larry Hallcroft, watch uh, very closely. But buying the flags and looking after the flagpole, the maintenance and the re and re of all of it, it's, it's an annual budget of around $40,000. This was a scene over the weekend as high winds tore the flag to shreds and just three days after it had been replaced. And with another series of storms hitting the lower mainland this week, it could be a costly time for other flag owners. However, storms like these aren't uncommon for this time of year. We are into our, we're, we're into the storm season. Um, storms typically come in frequency, you know, every 18 hours up to every 36 hours, uh, typically between October and February. That's just the storm pattern for this time of year. So not that uncommon. As storms continue for the next few months, so will a watchful eye from Devron and the staff hoping to catch the Canadian flag before it's torn away. As Devron says, though, it's not all about the cost of the flag, but showing their pride in the flag and having a symbol the community can recognize. The owner wants to make sure that uh, we're part of the community, doing everything we can to uphold the image of the store and be proud of the flag and our patriotism. So it's a big part of the fabric of the community here in North Surrey. And, uh, you know, our ownership here is pretty proud to say that they spend a lot of money trying to take care of it and keep that going for us. A new flag is set to be put up this week, and hopefully this flag can weather the next storm. Ben Phillips in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Ben Phillips joins us now. Ben, how did the flagpole end up in Surrey? Well, interesting you should ask, Twyla. The flagpole originally came from Expo 86, and at the time it was the tallest freestanding structure in North America, over 280 feet. But once the expo was over, it was moved to North Surrey, where it has been flying the Canadian flag ever since. Back to you. An Abbotsford studio raised funds at their annual Remembrance Day dance for the family of John, Constable John Davidson. Cheyenne bergen hainahauen shows us how dance is used to help a community heal and remember. The band is playing and the dancers are swinging at Suburban Swing in Abbotsford. But this year, the dancers are remembering more than the men and women who fought for Canada. They're also raising funds for the family of fallen police officer John Davidson. Alicia Horner attends Suburban Swing regularly, but this year it means a lot more. Well, he was a really good friend with my grandma, so I've known him for a long time. And he was, um, Whenever he talked to me, he was very um, nice, always very caring about me and um, like what was, whatever was going on with me and all that. Corporal John Davidson was killed in the line of duty on November 6th. So, anyone else? Several of those on hand came because of the fundraiser. Jason Warner and his wife Crystal Warner are the owners of Suburban Swing. Warner says he has a close connection with law enforcement agencies in the community. And so when something happens like that, uh, especially the agencies really feel it really strongly. So because this is the first uh, officer that's ever died in, a, in the line of duty with uh, being shot, um, a lot of us have really been trauma uh, traumatized by it a lot. So we've all come together and, and because I have a social side, this, this swing dancing gives me an opportunity to uh, give back to that community. Half of all ticket sales, including additional donations, are all going directly to Davidson's family. He was really heavily involved in community events, so I think that is another reason why people are coming together. 
A public celebration of life for John Davidson will take place at the Abbotsford Centre on November 19th at 1 p.m. Shyam Berchen Hainahawen in Abbotsford for BCIT Magazine. Coming up after the break, BCIT's successful microgrid is recognized by Business in Vancouver Magazine. A unique style of protest took place in East Vancouver. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT Magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame, and action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. Welcome back to another barn burning edition of BCIT's Community Calendar. We've got the playbook to get you to the best events in the Lower Mainland, so hold on to that pigskin and hold on tight and let's go! First down in 10, and we got 30 years of Christmas at Canada Place to celebrate. Come see beautifully decorated trees and a new Canada's North Lap display with a 15-foot moose sculpture. Running from November 23rd to December 31st, all at Canada Place. Heads up, Jimmy! And on second down, we've got the 22nd annual Hopscotch Festival at the PE, running from the 20th to the 26th, where you can taste specialty beers, wines, and cocktails, as well as our favorite Scotchy Scoff Scotch from around the world. Uh, that sounds like an easy 20 yards and a first down. We're in the red zone now, so head on down to Jackpool Plaza for this year's Vancouver Christmas Market. It runs from the 22nd till December 24th. Kids under six get in for free, and for adults, there's mold one! Touchdown! That was a great game, Jimmy! Thanks, Spence! Oh, uh, anyways, uh, that was your community calendar. Now go out there and have some fun, folks! Welcome back! BCIT produces environmentally friendly energy using a microgrid of solar panels. My co-anchor Aaron Schultz shows us how the grid generates power and what's next for the project. This seems like just another parking lot with a little bit of shelter. But a closer look shows students and staff are charging their vehicles thanks to the Energy Oasis project, one of the microgrid solar panels at BCIT's Burnaby campus. The panels just don't charge electric vehicles. The project's director says the panels also help power other parts of the campus. Lighting and, and uh, uh, um, heating, so on and so forth, are actually, uh, in fact, taken care of uh, by Energy Oasis. At the moment, of course, you know, what we, are, what we are generating is insufficient to take care of very large loads. Energy Oasis can store up to 250 kilowatts of power on a sunny day. But on a stormy day, only 40 or 50. BCIT smart new energy oasis wouldn't gather enough sunlight to fully power everything on campus. Uh, we wanted to have an environment in which we could actually understand how a system of this nature could work together, all the, uh, the different components that, that you need, the blueprint of, of an independent microgrid that could actually exist within a uh, fully built environment. BCIT SMAR is now looking to expand the Energy Oasis project to other parts of BCIT to give students and staff tools to produce more environmentally friendly energy. Aaron Schultz, in Burnaby, for BCIT Magazine. BCIT students are always encouraged to stretch their bodies as well as their minds. How do they fit this into their busy schedules? With help from the library. The library started their BCIT stretch program this year to help students slow down relax and smell the roses. Ty Embry is a BCIT rec leader and thought the library offered something a normal yoga studio might not. 
the library actually approached us and we kind of thought it would be cool to do like a yoga kind of stretch class in the library rather than people feeling the pressure of going to recreation or going to the gym. So it's just a, in a different setting, which is nice. The 15 to 30 minute stretching sessions run on Monday mornings in building SE14. We now go to our reporter in the field, Lloyd Nellis, who joins us from BCIT International Education Day. What's happening in the Great Hall, Lloyd? Thanks, Aaron. Right now, crews are preparing for today's festivities. The aims of today's events are to learn and experience all the different cultures that make up BCIT student body. We spoke to organizer Bryce Wibley about why he thinks it's important even for students who are from here to participate in today's events. And here's what he had to say. I think that this, uh, this event really will highlight sort of the, the role of, of international students in international education. And it is such an important uh, part of BCIT. It, it sort of reflects the larger uh, scale of the world um, with the globalized economies, um, globalized education systems. So it's really a celebration of all the benefits of international education. Now, whether that be um, for the international students who are coming here to BCIT, um, who really add a lot to the community here. BCIT students and faculty with experiences abroad will be speaking throughout the afternoon on, on their experiences and the importance of diversity. Back to you. We're now joined by Adam Dickinson, BCIT supervisor for grounds and landscaping, to talk about preparing for BCIT for the winter months. Adam, thank you very much for joining us. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you. Yep, okay, I think we'll start off with here with what exactly is BCIT going to be doing differently this year to prepare for the snow and ice rather than last year? Well, it's an exciting year for us. We've got uh, some new equipment. We've um, invested in a brine maker, um, some electric UTV vehicles, Polaris vehicles, um, and some uh, new plow equipment. All right, now you mentioned the brine maker at first. Exactly what is a brine maker and what does it do to cam combat the ice and snow? So a brine maker, um, uh, will uh, use salt to produce a brine, which in turn will go into a hopper on the back of our brand new F-350 pickup truck. Um, and that in itself has an applicator that will go around the campus and spray a brine solution on the roads and parking lots to help prevent the formation of ice. And finally, Adam, last year the snow in the parking lots was a bit of an issue for students and staff looking to park, of course, needing to plow the snow to the sides just to get on the ice underneath and piles formed up in spots so students weren't able to park. Is BCIT going to do anything differently to deal with the snow piles in the parking lots? Absolutely. We've been uh, in partnership with Safety and Security um, working on a solution. So our contractors are actually going to be plowing the snow in the lots putting it into trucks and taking it away as it accumulates so we won't have any more large piles of snow in the parking lots and uh, freeing up all the space and keeping it safe. Adam, thank you very much for taking time out of your day and joining us and I think it will be a smoother winter this go around. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to it. Thank uh, you. The first free market in New Westminster opened this weekend. My co-anchor Twyla Amato has the story on what the market is and what it hopes to accomplish. The rush has died down at the New Westminster Free Market, but some stragglers are still sorting through items sometime later. The market aims to build a gifting and moneyless community. Participants bring things they no longer want or need, which are then free for others to take. The organizers say people rely too much on money. Yeah, we're inundated with capitalism and people always trying to spend money on things they don't need when there's a lot of stuff that already exists that we can just share with one another and we can avoid having a lot of things going to the dumpsters um, by sharing stuff. Isn't that cool? There is no trading or bartering and no strings attached. People bringing items don't have to receive anything. And people receiving items don't have to give anything in return. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Another free market organizer finds it satisfying to give to others. One of the wonderful things with the free market you get a chance to possibly see where it goes and, and see the joy on someone's face when they get to grab that article. A few people brought music and food, others gave professional advice for free. The free market as a whole is a way to create a community that gives back and shares with each other. It's a way to give people a healthy outlet. And the organizers hope this experience encourages people to rely on each other instead of money. Twyla Amato in New Westminster for BCIT Magazine. 
The advocacy groups Vancouver Chicken Save and Anonymous for the Voiceless used an uncommon tactic to display animal cruelty in a new way. Our reporter Lloyd Nellis has the story. A warning, this story does include graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. Passerbys at Commercial Broadway were witnesses to an earthling experience. Zoe Pellet organized the event to educate the public on the harsh facts behind food processing. The same facts that got her into activism. So it was very shocking, as it is to many. Um, so that's where the activism was born, was learning about what happens and um, learning about a lot of the things that we don't see. The group protests rely less on chants or yells and more on visuals like this. They donned masks while holding graphic footage of animals being processed from the documentary Earthlings. A technique Pellet admits can be uncomfortable. This is not easy material to look at. I've seen it all before. I've seen it for years and it's still not easy to look at. And the inherent nature of humans is that we don't want to look at things that make us uncomfortable or make us sad. But we are required to. The groups have members around to talk to people about the images they're seeing. One onlooker says that while they wouldn't try to convert meat eaters, it could be helpful for some to see the videos. A few months ago I had seen that on the other side and I couldn't watch it because it's too disturbing even though I'm, I'm mostly a vegetarian. Well, because it kind of made me furious. Like, like, I know I can't convince other. I wouldn't try to convince people to become vegetarian or change their diet, but at least it could reduce the amount of meat they eat. Pellet hopes that the protest will encourage people to fearlessly watch similar things. When we start turning our backs on this information and we choose to only watch things that make us feel great, um, we're permitting for a lot of injustice to continue. The groups say they will look into putting on more unique events. Lloyd Nellis in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. If you have any questions regarding the show, you can contact us at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. Thank you for watching BCIT Magazine. I'm Aaron Schultz. And I'm Twyla Amato. We leave you now with the Vancouver skyline and Grouse Mountain.